going to be Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to look at the topic of what manner of man is this. You see, everywhere Jesus went, he made the people marvel. They looked on him with great admiration. It says in Matthew 8, 27, But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? You see, today men marvel over the superheroes from the comics. I guess that's where they got their, their name from, the Marvel Comics. But Jesus is the real person to marvel over. Jesus was a man who cleanses lepers. That's the first thing. In Matthew 8, 1, it says, When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. So he came down. He was always on the move, working with his hands. He went up to this mountain in Matthew 5, 1. This mountain that he's on, he went up to it in Matthew 5, 1 when he gave the Sermon on the Mount. He's just now coming down. And many people think that their shepherd's work ends after the sermon. But as you're going to see, it's just getting started. What manner of man is this? A working man. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. So why do you think he could sleep in a ship during a sea storm? And it says great multitudes followed him. If he had a YouTube or a Facebook or any of that stuff back then, he would have had the most subscribers, likes, and follows, even if it was just by people who wanted to criticize everything that he said. I mean, no doubt the Pharisees accused him of being a cult leader. They probably accused the disciples of drinking the Kool-Aid at the Lord's Supper. But anyone with any sense wanted to follow him, especially the people who nobody wanted around, like the lepers. In Matthew 8, 2, it says, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. So notice the leper worships him, and this proves that the leper knew that he was Lord. He knew that Jesus Christ was the one with the healing power. Also notice that the Lord didn't reject the worship, and this proves that he believed that he himself was Lord. It says in Matthew 8, 3, And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. All it took was a touch from Jesus Christ, and he was made clean. He cleansed the leper. And notice that it happened immediately. This is a picture of your salvation. You came to Jesus Christ, and you knew he was the Son of God who died on the cross to pay for your sins. You called on the Lord and said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Not in those exact words, but you know what I mean. Immediately, the blood of Jesus Christ washed your soul, took your sins away, the Holy Spirit cut your soul loose from your flesh, and no longer can your soul be contaminated with sin anymore. Everything you got at salvation happened immediately. It wasn't a process. You see, the leper didn't have to go through a bunch of steps. He got cleansed instantly. And in Matthew 8, 4, it says, And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man. But go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. The Lord probably told him to tell no man, because many times when the word, word got out about the Lord, they began to fall and stomp on one another. Like in Luke one twenty one, it says, In the meantime, when they were, they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another. These people were in such a rush to get to Jesus, to get healed or whatever, they just stomped on one another. It, he probably told him to tell nobody because, you know, a lot of times they tried to come and make him king, and it wasn't time for him to be king yet. That could be another reason. And he just simply wasn't trying to get a fan base. That's another reason. Jesus simply told him to go his way, show himself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony. Just like when you got saved, you did something afterwards for a testimony. Believer's baptism. It could also be a testimony that Jesus Christ is a prophet like unto Moses, who also healed leprosy. And it says he's a prophet like unto Moses in Acts chapter 7, 37. And in Exodus 4, 6 through 7 is where Moses cleanses his own leprosy. 
Most men wouldn't come close to a leper under the law. I mean, you weren't supposed to, as it talks about in Leviticus 13, 45. But Jesus Christ is an exception because he came to take their infirmities and bear their sicknesses. That's what he came to do. But what manner of man is this that cleanses the lepers? What manner of man is this that cures without contact? He cures without contact. In Matthew 8, 5, it says, And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. A centurion is a man that is uh, over a group of a hundred soldiers. Centurion like century. Uh, what manner of man is this that even a man of authority comes to him for help? He comes beseeching him. He takes a lot. It takes a lot of humbling for a man with such authority to beseech another man. Beseech just means to ask or to pray with urgency. This shows the centurion knew that he was God. In Matthew 8, 6, it says, And saying, Lord, the centurion here, says, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Now he calls him Lord, just like the leper did. This centurion has a servant sick of the palsy, a muscular disease. You know, where someone's like, they're paralyzed. The, it's the loss or... or Defect of the power of voluntary mus muscular motion in the whole body. He's in rough shape. And this servant is grievously tormented. And on earth the torment can be healed. And it's a light affliction that is but for a moment in light of eternity. And unlike the kind that you find in hell. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Notice the Lord is willing to make the trip to his house, but... The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servants shall be healed. What we've learned so far is the leper, back up there, knew he was dirty and knew he needed to be cleansed. He knew the Lord was the only one who could help. Both the leper and the centurion here called Jesus Lord. The centurion is humbled, as is the leper. He even says, I am not worthy. That is the shape you are in when you get saved. You know you're unworthy. You know you're dirty. You know you need to be cleaned. You know your righteousness isn't good enough. But just as the centurion says, speak the word only, you also put your trust in the word of the Lord. He had trust that the word of Jesus would come through. I mean, you believed it when it said Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, shed his blood, was buried and resurrected. You believed the word when it said that. The centurion believed the word of God could... Do whatever it said he would do. The centurion says, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. You weren't worthy for the Lord to save you and use your body as his temple. But he came under your roof. I mean, he came in your body. The centurion knew that the Lord didn't have to be there to heal his servant. He knew he could cure without contact. It says in Matthew 8 9, the centurion says, For I am a man under authority having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Just as the centurion's words had authority over his soldiers, he knew the Lord had authority in his words to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils, and heal the palsy. In Matthew 18, it says, And when Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Wouldn't you like to have such great faith that it could it could make the Son of God to marvel? He hadn't found so great faith, no, not in Israel. The centurion is a Roman, a Gentile, and the Lord hasn't seen any of the Jews with as much faith that this Gentile had. So he says, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And he says, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He says kingdom of God instead of kingdom of heaven in Luke 13, 29. Because this is referring to the millennium. And in the millennium, both kingdoms are present. So that's why they're used interchangeably. You see, you have the physical kingdom with Jesus Christ reigning over a physical throne in the kingdom of heaven. Which is going to be on earth in Jerusalem. And you have the spiritual kingdom with Jesus Christ reigning with church age saints who are in spiritual flesh and bone bodies, and this will make up the kingdom of God. You'll have the best of both worlds. Jesus Christ running over both kingdoms, the physical and spiritual kingdom at this time, 
the spiritual kingdom would also become visible. And many Gentiles will come from the east and west and sit down with the Jews like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And this kingdom of heaven, remember, it's not the third heaven where God dwells. It refers to a physical kingdom on earth, specifically here, the millennial kingdom. And that's where you will sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Imagine being in your glorified body and being able to sit down with Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob and other Old Testament saints in the kingdom. On earth, during the kingdom, you will have saints in glorified bodies. You'll have Old Testament saints. You'll have saints that came out of the tribulation. And just Gentiles from the nations that help the Jews in their physical bodies. And they get in on the commonwealth of Israel. In Matthew eight twelve it says, But the children of the kingdom, specifically here, not referring to safe people, but to Israel, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, gnashing of teeth, grinding or striking the teeth together in anger. But the children of the kingdom is not referring to safe people here specifically. It's simply men who are in the, going to be in the future kingdom of heaven. And he, here I believe he's referring to children of Israel who are in the kingdom. But will wind up in outer darkness because they are rejecting the Lord. And he's making a comparison here between this Gentile centurion and Israel. You know, saying he's not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And there's going to be plenty of uh, children of the kingdom, Jews, who don't have faith and reject the Lord, and they're going to be cast out in outer darkness. And there's going to be plenty of Gentiles that get in and stick. You see, just because they are circumcised Jews doesn't mean they are better. You see, the Gentile centurion has, has much more faith than these children of the kingdom. It said he had found so great faith, no, not in Israel. You see, a natural-born Jew who won't receive Jesus Christ will go to outer darkness just like any lost person. In Matthew eight thirteen, it says, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. So notice he said, As thou hast believed. You see, he had a lot of faith, and it resulted in his servant being healed without a house call. And Jesus spoke the word only, and he was healed in the selfsame hour. He cures without contact. See, what manner of man is this that cleanses the lepers and cures without contact? What manner of man is this that comes in your house? You see, he comes in your house. He, could, he would have went into the centurion's house, but he told him not to. The Lord was willing to go up into the centurion's house. He just touched the leper. So I don't think going into a Gentile's house would have bothered him. Now, if he's going to touch a leper, I don't think coming in a nasty house is going to bother him. The Lord does make house calls. And in Matthew eight fourteen it says, And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. The fact that Peter has a mother-in-law proves that he's married and that he's not a pope. You see, popes don't get married. There's no way they'd have a mother-in-law. Uh, you kind of wonder if Peter was hoping that this was the one time maybe Jesus' healing powers wouldn't work. I mean, it's his mother-in-law and all we're talking about here. He might have not wanted her to get healed. But the Lord Jesus Christ has no misfires. Everybody gets healed. And But Jesus, it says, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. You see, he went in there with no mask, no vaccine, no questions, no social distancing, and just touched her hand, and she was healed immediately. He didn't get word about catching it. See, this is a good picture of you getting right with the Lord and bringing Jesus into your house to get the rest of your family right. That's what Peter did. What manner of man is this? He cleanses the lepers. He cures without contact. He comes into your house. And he can even cast out spirits. It says in Matthew eight sixteen, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and he healed all that were sick there's that word again he heals with his word and cast out spirits with his word he healed all that were sick once again there aren't any misfires there was never a time when he touched someone's hands and it didn't work his healing ministry was to fulfill the word Notice it says in seventeen eight seventeen that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Isaiah is Isaiah. 
And the prophecy is from Isaiah 53, 4, which says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did stream him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And since we are on the topic of him casting out spirits, let's skip down to verse 28. You know, we were in verse 17. Just skip down to verse 28, where he actually casts out some spirits here. And I'm going to show you how the Bible has a built-in book of devilology. In Matthew 8, 28, it says, And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. In Luke's account, he gives you the perspective of just one of the men being possessed with devils. And he said, This man had the devils a long time. So those devils, they pretty much took off their shoes in there and stayed a while. They made themselves at home in that man's body. In Luke eleven twenty four, the unclean spirit calls the body of the person he is possessing his house. You know, we talked about how, you know, we're not the centurion wasn't worthy for Jesus to come under his roof. We weren't worthy for Jesus to come under our roof in our bodies. And these, un you see, the, the Holy Spirit uses our body as a housing. Just like the unclean spirit will use a man's body as their housing. And Luke describes in his gospel in chapter 8 and verse 27 that the devil possessed man, this same devil possessed man that we're talking about Matthew 8, wear no clothes. He walked around naked, so he was in a state of being completely unashamed for any wrongdoing. Sort of like a pride parade just going around flaunting what he should be ashamed about and luke also describes him as abiding in the tombs as matthew describes these two devil possessed men were coming out of the tombs and this hints at a death obsession they're obsessed with death so like death metal uh people who are so uh, love death hang around graveyards things like that Mark 5.5 5 describes how night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs. So staying up all night and sleeping all day. And it's significant that it said in the mountains because the devil loves those high places. And in the Old Testament, uh, they were to get rid of those high places. And the devil wanted to be like the most high. They liked those high places. Luke gives an extra detail that the devil-possessed man didn't abide in any house. You see, a good, balanced home life is key to staying out of trouble. You see, when you get off work, go home and be with your family. Don't stay out all day and night like this devil-possessed man. In Luke 8, 39, the Lord even tells the man to return to thine own house. After he got the devils out of him, he tells him to return to his own house. You see, he's got a house, he just ain't abiding in it. In Luke 8, 29, it shows us that this devil-possessed man had supernatural strength. He broke the chains and fetters. The fetters is what was confining his feet. And, and he broke the chains that he was bound with. Notice that the Bible first called them devils. It doesn't call them demons. The Bible calls demons devils. So what you know as demons, the Bible calls it devils. So that's why I say it's a book of it's got a built-in book of a devilology. In Mark 5, 2, it gives insight that the man has an unclean spirit. Yet, it says they have many devils in them. So many devils must make up an unclean spirit when you get real technical about it. I know we use it interchangeably sometimes, call, it, call unclean spirit devils, unclean spirits, but it seems like possibly many devils is what makes up an unclean spirit, if you want to get technical. So they were exceeding fierce. They were like vehement, violent, furious, and savage. Kind of what the rappers brag about being today. I heard a song not too long ago by some rapper saying, talking about those songs about how savage they are. Uh, these, these devils were so fierce. The man was so fierce that no man could pass by that way. Uh, they couldn't even walk through the neighborhood. Mark 5, 4 describes how neither could any man tame him. You've heard, uh, I think I, there was a CD called that a long time ago called Can't Be Tamed. So the, the singers and rappers glorify this trait. In Mark 5, 5, it describes how he was always crying and cutting himself with stones. 
That's interesting. Just like those prophets of Baal did back there when they went against Elijah and couldn't win. But what manner of man is this? Who can pass by that way? What manner of man is this that could take on this many devils? You see, no man might pass by that way. He was so fierce. But what manner of man is this, the Lord Jesus, who can pass by that way? And when the Lord Jesus Christ asked their name, it says in Luke 8, 30, and Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. But they were no match for this man. What manner of man is this? And here he is, the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. He wasn't showing up as the line of the tribe of Judah yet. He was just showing up as the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. And he was still able to pass by that way. In Matthew 8, 29, it says, And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Luke adds in that the devil-possessed man went so far as falling down before Jesus. It says in Luke 8, 28, when, we, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. So this shows that the devils knew he was more powerful. And in Luke 8, 28, it gives the detail how they called Jesus Christ the Son of God Most High. Even though they worked for the devil himself, they knew old Lucifer only wanted to be like the Most High. They knew Jesus Christ was Son of God Most High. The devil wasn't. They knew who the Big Daddy was. And Mark describes how he even went as far as worshiping Jesus Christ. But when he saw Jesus afar so off, he ran and worshipped him. Matthew points out that they called Jesus the Son of God and asked him not to torment them before the time. And notice that the devils have their doctrine straight. They know more than the Pharisees. They admit that he is the Son of God. They admit that there's hell. They believe in hellfire to the point that they even ask him if he is about to torment them before the time. You see, the, devil, the devils know Jesus Christ and his followers. In Acts 19.15, it says, And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? So that you see, they know who Jesus Christ is. They know who his followers are. It says in James 2.19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. The devils knew their fate is a lake of fire, and they're looking eyeball to eyeball with the one who created it. In Matthew 8, 30, it says, And there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. So the devils also knew that they were in the midst of the one who had the power to cast them out, and they didn't want to walk through dry places looking for another person to inhabit. So they requested to go away into the herd of swine. So it says, And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. What this shows us is that the devils are connected with suicide. They cause these animals to commit suicide. It also shows us that they don't care if they're going to inhabit a live body or a dead body. They didn't care if the pigs were alive. They were killing them. It also shows that they are so nasty that they would inhabit a pig. So all the entertainers who brag about being possessed are idiots. I mean, there's nothing special. They inhabit pigs. Of course, they'll inhabit you. In Mark 5.13, it describes how it was about 2,000 pigs. So if just one devil got in each pig, this shows that the men had 2,000, at least 2,000 devils in them. Now, some of the devils could have possibly, possibly went in one pig, like a pig could have had five pigs. Or I mean, Mary Magdalene had seven devils in her. I mean, there was many devils in these two men. So I don't know if there was 2,000 spirits, 2,000 devils, or 2, 000, just 2,000 pigs that thousands and thousands of devils went into. Another fact is that two men were more important to Jesus Christ than 2,000 hogs. You see, God doesn't put the animals above people. And in Luke, he gives the detail that these devils didn't want to go into the deep. It says in Luke 8, 31, And they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. But when he, they got into the swine, they went off into the deep when they got in the pigs anyway. So they could have been referring to the other deep. 
You see, the other deep, that's that location up there between the third and the second heaven where Leviathan is. And Luke 8, 34 shows that when those devils were cast out, that the man was then clothed and in his right mind. When you get to Jesus Christ, you get a sound mind. It says in Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what manner of man is this that can take a lost man's brain and his word can rewire it, unclog it, fix it, repair it, and get it ready for every good work? Mark 5.20 describes how the man went out and published great things Jesus had done for him. But you see, the people of the city were mad. You know, unlike Jesus Christ, they thought the hogs were more important than the two souls. And in Matthew 8.33, it says, And they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything. And what was befallen to the possessed of the devils? Kind of like men do now. All they talk about is what happened to the men who are possessed with devils. You know, all people talk about is the celebrities, the rockers, the rappers, the Hollywood elite, the corrupt politicians. That's all they talk about is the people who are possessed with devils. That's what they go around talking about all the time. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. Kind of makes you wonder if the devils committed hogicide simply to make the people of the city hate Jesus for killing their pigs. You see, Jesus would have known it if that was the case. Yet he did it anyway. Maybe as a test to see if they cared more of the world and wickedness or more for the Lord and righteousness. Another possibility that he allowed to give devils to go into the pigs was because it kind of went along with the illustration from the last chapter. We saw in the last chapter how pigs picture false prophets, where he said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. In this case, the Lord is showing you what to cast before the swine. The scraps. Don't cast the pearls, but the scraps. The unclean stuff. That's what you put before the swine. That's what those evil spirits are. So he let them go into the swine. So what manner of man is this that he has such power over the spiritual wickedness? He can cast out the spirits. What manner of man is this that you need to count the cost? You have to count the cost to follow him. In Matthew eight eighteen, it says, And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart until the other side. He wasn't trying to get a huge following. Isn't it funny that the person who needs to be followed the most wasn't trying to boost his fan base? But it says, A certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. A scribe is someone who wrote. Is this man just someone who could copy the scriptures on paper, or was he willing to follow Jesus? He claims he would follow the Lord wherever he went. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus is saying, saying this to show the scribe that it's not going to be a picnic to follow him. It's rough. Sometimes you don't even have a place to lay your head at night. And it says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he calls himself the Son of Man. He says himself that he didn't even have a place to lay his head. He might have had rocks for pillows most times, just like Jake, Jacob did back there in Genesis 28. The foxes have holes. Even the foxes have holes, but Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. Foxes are spoken of very negatively in the Bible. In Luke 13, 32, Jesus Christ calls Herod a fox. The wicked man Herod, he calls him a fox. Samson caught 300 foxes, tied them together, set them on fire, and burned the Philistines' cornfields down in Judges 15. In Nehemiah 8.3, Tobiah just happens to refer to a fox breaking down the wall. David says in Psalm 63, 9 and 10, But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. In Song of Solomon 2.15, it says, Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. In Lamentations 5.18, it says, Because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate, desolate, the foxes walk upon it. They're even compared to bad prophets. In Ezekiel 13.3 and 4, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit. And have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. 
You see, when a woman wears the attire of an harlot, like in Proverbs 17, what does the world call her, or used to call her? A foxy lady. You see, and this is also where you get the saying, foxholes. The foxes have holes. But Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. The birds of the air have nests. But Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. And birds are like an unclean spirits in the Bible. In Genesis 8, 7, the raven leaves the ark and goes to and fro, just like the devil, probably feeding on floating corpses. In the tribulation, Babylon is the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Revelation 18, 2. In Isaiah 34, 11, the raven, the cormorant, the bittern, and the owl are associated with the lake of fire. Possibly the Lord is not only saying the animals have homes when he doesn't have a home, but since he's using these uh, animals that are often compared to lost people and unclean spirits, he's saying even lost people have homes and he doesn't. So lost people a lot of times have it better than the righteous. The wicked prosper. Why do the wicked prosper in this life? Possibly because they've sold themselves to work evil in the sight of the Lord. But he's pretty much saying this scribe, you need to count the cost before you follow me. It's going to cost you something. It's not going to be just sitting down writing and copying stuff. In Matthew eight twenty one, it says, Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Notice the key words, me first. You see, following Jesus Christ, you need to notice that he never put himself first. In Romans 15, 1 and 2, it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. In Romans 15, 3, it says, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. And Philippians 2, 4 through 7, it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took on him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. To follow Jesus Christ, you need to put Jesus first, others second, and you last. That's joy. J-O-Y. In Matthew eight twenty one and 22, it says, Another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Jesus isn't against funerals. He's basically letting this guy know that there are going to be times when the ministry stops you from doing things that the average everyday person does, such as burying their own father. You see, there's a cost to follow Jesus. It may vary for some people, but there's a cost in some way. It's going to stop you from doing the things that normal people do sometimes. If anything, it costs time. All the time you would spend doing something for fun or for yourself is put on something else. And looking at a lot of pastors and evangelists, you get the idea that following Jesus Christ is almost like being some type of celebrity. I mean, they got a flashy house, flashy car, flashy suit, beautiful wife, seemingly perfect, beautiful, and well-behaved children, and the money's flowing. Obviously, these aren't bad things, but people want their autograph. They're celebrated. People make odds and play the respecting persons game around them. It's like they're being a mini Christian celebrity. But if you're really following the Lord, it's going to cost you in some way. And those same men probably have something that's costing them in their life and we just can't see it. But what manner of men is this that gives you everything for free, but you still got to count the cost to follow him? Even though it costs to follow him, he still loads you down with benefits. So what manner of men is this that calms the storm? In Matthew eight twenty three, it says, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Notice it wasn't the scribe or that other disciple but it was his disciples. The twelve followed him. They counted the cost and followed him anyway. And when you follow him, it can be dangerous. You may be following him right into a storm. In Matthew eight twenty four, it says, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. A tempest is like a great violent wind. And this ship was covered with the waves and was being tossed to and fro. And the Lord was asleep. Like I said, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. When you went to work and tried your best to do everything for God that day, you're going to sleep in a storm. You can use, you can just use the storm like a sleep sound machine, you know. In Matthew 8, 25 and 26, And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, ye little faith? And he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So he questions about their fear and their faith because they should have known they weren't going to die in that ship. The Lord himself was in the ship. They followed him into a storm. 
but they should have known he's the one who calms the storm. It says, but the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? He went out there and told the storm to stop, and it stopped immediately. Uh, Kenneth Copeland claims he told a tornado to go back up in the sky, and that it did. But that man is a liar. Only Jesus Christ can calm the storm. The disciples were being tossed to and fro and almost made a shipwreck, but they went to the master. You see, many times a Christian can be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Ephesians 4.14 and concerning faith, they end up making shipwreck, 1 Timothy 1.19. But they just need to go cry to the master in prayer, and he can take care of the problems. So what manner of man is this that can do all these things? It's the Lord Jesus Christ.